And we have uh, joining us, but a small little connection problem, but you will see her very soon, Madeleine Tuininga, who is head of unit at DG Trade at the European Commission in Brussels. And she has worked extensively with trade, uh, sustainable, sustainable development uh, and in EU's trade uh, agreements. And you're all very welcome. So trade liberalization has served as a catalyst for economic growth, investment and job opportunities. But recently, there has been an increased public demand that trade agreements also take into account values, respect for human rights, environmental concerns, and labor conditions. The citizens, the consumers, expect companies to be responsible and to contribute to fair trade. And many companies are responsible and are doing a lot of social uh, corporate responsibility uh, projects. But this has also led to discussion on how it can be included in a more systematic way in trade agreements uh, and how, how that, that can be linked to, to, to sustainable development. In the US-Canada-Mexico agreement, NAFTA, was probably in 1994 the first to include labor right provisions. And the EU has had specific chapters on trade and sustainable development in all free trade agreements, starting with the one with South Korea in 2011. But there were also some provisions, including in the one made with the, with the Caribbean, the CARIFORUM agreement in 2008. And other countries have it as well. And in the um, CPTPP between the 12 uh, countries in, in, in North Latin America, and Asia, there are special provisions on labor and also the aim to set up an advisory council on labor uh, rights. So this is about respecting and promoting high labor standards and make sure that the freedom of association is respected in the context of allowing the labor force to organize themselves in trade unions and participate in negotiations. And when this is referred to, it is very often, if not always, refer to the core conventions of the ILO, the international labor organizations. But how does this work in practice? Uh, it's one thing to put beautiful words in and to say commitments, but how does it work and what are the effects? This is what we will discuss today. And we will also a little bit later come into the topic of forced labor, which is a serious problem all over the world. Uh, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. So, Kathleen, why, why don't you start? How has the U.S. approached the issue of labor and trade? Can you give us a, a brief overview to help us understand? Sure. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Cecilia. I'm delighted to be with you and with my distinguished colleagues this morning. It's great to see so many friends and experts on, on the call. Um, I, I will tell in very brief the sort of uh, story of how the U.S. has approached the issue, but I want to just lead with two things that we can park for another day, uh, given the shortness of time. The first is that the main focus in this discussion tends to be on trade agreements and labor chapters within them. So that's what I will I will discuss, but there are so many fa facets to them. And, and they're quite different, as, as we'll talk about in a moment, from the EU approach, connecting them, <clears throat> excuse me, to sustainable development. But I, I also don't want to forget there are other sorts of agreements and forms of cooperation uh, that we could also talk about. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit. And that these provisions don't stand alone. There's a particular um, definition or sense of labor in these chapters, but they're not the only part of the conversation that we, we could have. The second uh, topic I want to also park for another day is that we have a number of themes that now come in under the heading of labor. Uh, and that is uh, themes that are that are maybe premised on other sorts of systems like gender, for example, or migration, migrant workers, that we sort of put in there in the labor chapters, maybe for lack of another place, but likewise could stand alone. So two sort of uh, caveats up front that I just wanted to mention. But but in, in the interest of answering your question, let me give a very brief overview of how the United States approach has evolved or not. Uh, one common starting point for this conversation is the side agreement to the NAFTA. So now we're talking back in the early 1990s, the side agreement to the North American Free Trade Agreement was this North American Agreement on Labor Cooperation. And I emphasize that this was a side agreement. We started off with labor as a sort of controversial afterthought. And now, we'll fast forward to today where we're actively focused on these topics, not just in the United States, but you also see the language from that side agreement to the NAFTA appearing 
in other trade agreements from around the world. And so that's why it's important to sort of refer to the NALC as the starting point. Uh, and let's look at it then closely in terms of substance and, and penalties. The NALC included some obligations on the part of each of its members. And again, here we're talking about the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, obligations, but in a sort of light way. The, the main provision that we're talking about here is that of ensuring that there are labor laws in the domestic law and regulations that provide for high labor standards. That was the language in the NALC, the sort of very light touch, ensure that you actually have labor laws uh, that, in, that provide for high labor standards in your domestic law. The second piece of that was then making sure that you, each of those three countries, internally effectively enforce that law. So this is the common approach that we then see maintained in subsequent agreements. We agree to sort of harmonize up, not too much usually, and then we ask the country to enforce those very laws. And that becomes the sort of twofold, adopt and maintain certain laws, effectively enforce those laws. What are the laws? They do evolve somewhat over time, but they often now refer to some of the major labor principles and rights based in the ILO conventions. Now, the NALC also included a state-to-state -state enforcement mechanism, and the mechanism would have allowed for the convening of an arbitral panel to consider where one of the countries was engaged in what's called a persistent pattern of failing to enforce those laws. So again, this comes back to the second major uh, commitment in the, in the agreement, effectively enforce those laws. If you're not doing it in a persistent pattern of failure, then one country could sue the other but only on particular labor rights. So this was a very narrow space for enforcement. And in fact, it was never used. There were a number of discussions, uh, particularly raised with the US government about labor violations in Mexico, but none of them ever led to, to a panel on the topic. Now, over the last 30 years, those provisions have grown in scope, both substantively, we've had more areas, more labor rights addressed, and procedurally. We move from a side agreement, as it was with the NAFTA, to a full chapter, as many will know, in our, our trade agreements of today, and with different remedies being tested in that state-to-state -state mechanism. We've had one state-to-state -state case that I can talk more about later. But the last point I'll mention is this one important moment in the story, which was May 10th, 2007. May 10th, 2007, we have a deal between Democrats and Republicans, after which we sort of get locked in to the possibility of having binding provisions enforced by the same sorts of state-to-state -state mechanism as the rest of the commercial commitments. So let me say that one more time. From 2007 forward, it's the labor commitments that are now the ones that are binding can now be enforced in the same sorts of arbitration that we see for the rest of our, of our trade agreements. Before that, labor was sometimes subject to special, more limited penalties and remedies. So that's been the trend up until now, up till we get to the USMCA, which I know we'll, we'll come back to. Throughout that period, a good deal of path dependence. The US language sort of stays the same in many respects, in part because of limitations politically memorialized in, in language from, from Congress. And, and just to end where, where, where I began, again, these don't stand alone, even talking about the agreements themselves. Alongside these chapters, we have annexes for reform. We have robust cross-border monitoring, cooperation, et cetera, but that's the gist of it, Cecilia. Thank you so much for this. Yes, of course, you're absolutely right. There are so many other forums of cooperation where these things could be addressed as well. So of course they, they are part of it, but, but trying to focus a little bit on, on, on trade. And then of course, the, the, the fact that there is a trade agreement with the country also leads to a whole lot of other forms of cooperation, which is, is good in itself. Uh, Madeleine, uh, from the EU perspective, I know that, that you are one of those who have been working longest with this. You and I have been in several countries uh, talking about uh, labour rights as well. So, so can you give us a, a short summary of how the EU um, um, deals with this in trade agreements and in trade relations? Yes, sure. And also for my uh, the pleasure to be here with old friends. Uh, particularly with you, and thank you for inviting me, Cecilia. So nice to see you with the same smile as ever. So, I um, I mean, it, it, from our end, it's like um, like what, um, it's the same. Huh? The, we are taken up in many tools, multilateral, bilateral, 
unilateral and also autonomous measures. And that also goes for the philosophy that we think that you actually need to combine all these tools. Um, now, in terms of commitments, and some of them are also combined in RFTAs, in terms of commitments, you've already um, indicated that the first real trade and sustainable development chapter was Korea in 2011. We've see, thought, thought that we needed to put them together, labor, environment, and, and the sustainability issues. Um, in terms of commitments, uh, we have several commitments that are important for labor. So binding international commitments, um, focus on the fo uh, fundamentals, so the four ILO fundamental com conventions, we all know them, non-discrimination, freedom of association, forced labor and child labor, but to which we now added OSHA, Occupational Health and Safety and Word Work and Labor Inspection. So that's quite a full package. But I would also say that we also have gender provisions, um, which are largely embedded in labor because of the non-discrimination angle, and uh, which we now increasingly see um, is very important, uh, responsible business conduct and due diligence. So that's also part in our um, TSD chapters, and this brings in the business dimension. Um, the philosophy that you see reflected is to a large extent that labor issues require long-term engagement and bring about to bring about lasting changes in a context that is often complex and linked to social, political, economic, and historical aspects. So key pillar in our approach are partnership in enforcement and implementation with the countries, stakeholders, and international organizations. Now, um, in the FTAs, um, so we, we have already said we have um, a, a bit of a similar as, as, as the US, a binding commitment uh, for the effective implementation of these labor conventions um, in terms of ratification. So there's an obligation to ratify uh, ILO core conventions and for the effective implementation and, and enforcement. And stakeholders take an important part in the monitoring and enforcement. We have these uh, so-called DAGs, domestic advisory groups, and stakeholders' involvement. And we had, until recently, um, dedicated dispute settlement mechanisms. The first dispute settlement ever in an FTA, um, even outside TSD, was um, uh, on labor in Korea. And Cecilia, you will well remember, Maybe to highlight the outcome of how important this was, it confirmed that ratification is an obligation in, in, uh, in FTAs and that core principles of labor apply even if a country has not ratified the uh, convention concerned, in the ILO convention concerned. Briefly to say that there are several evolutions in our approach. So I would say in the first place from Korea to Mexico and then New Zealand, um, uh, up to uh, before Mexico, we had a dedicated stakeholders mechanism only for TSD. That didn't make sense. So this applies now to the entire tra uh, free trade agreement to also be able to make interconnections between the various chapters in the FTA. Then the second is from Korea to the TSD review and the Trade and Sustainable Development Review. So we reviewed the chapters and the effectiveness of it to New Zealand in New Zealand we do not have any more a dedicated dispute settlement mechanism that is integrated in the general dispute settlement mechanisms for violations of the principles of labor standards or environment, which means that so-called sanctions also apply as a last resort. And then, as I already mentioned, the evolution is also that we've expanded the core labor standards to um, uh, occupational health and safety uh, at work, and um, and um, uh, labor inspections. You asked me to be short, so I'll leave it here. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's plenty to, to come back to, uh, obviously, uh, but, but let's try to get the general picture first. Karen, uh, you, you heard both Kathleen and Madeleine refers to the ILO core conventions, and ILO is obviously a very important pillar here because it, it is the international standards. But how, how is the relation? Is, is it meaningful to have um, ha have provisions on, on trade and labor in, in trade agreements? And can it actually work? I you know you've been working on this for, for, for so many years, so, so please share your expertise as well. Thank you so much, Cecilia. And, and as the other panelists, thank you so much for, for having us. Um, I think I'm going to start uh, first, actually, from uh, the, the philosophical perspective. I mean, for the ILO and even at its uh, very outset, 
trade and labor are really intrinsically interlinked. You cannot really separate one from the other. Um, obviously, if goods are exported from one country to another and they're produced with uh, labor and conditions involving grave injustice, as indicated in the ILO Constitution, um, where basic minimum standards are not uh, abided by, there's an imbalance, a tilting of the uh, what we aim at, which is that level playing field, um, and, and therefore using the violation of labor rights as a comparative advantage, uh, something that the ILO was really aimed at um, uh, really eliminating. It only wreaks havoc in not only the commercial order, but also jeopardizes the social peace um, that the ILO is actually aimed at, uh, at really trying to promote. And so uh, it was created to avoid that race to the bottom, to set those minimum labor standards. Um, and in this light, we see that labor provisions um, can be a very important uh, support for that process of ensuring that level playing field. They've become a, a common stronghold in trade agreements um, and uh, ILO standards and their supervisory mechanisms are what are counted on as serving as the essential independent and impartial support for those agreements to make sure that the agreements are not used for protectionist purposes, but only to really ensure that fundamental principles and rights at work to which the entire international community have signed on to, not only through the uh, possibly the ratification, but if not the ratification, the 1998 Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, which was mentioned, um, and also the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there really is a broad international community acceptance that these are the minimum standards that everybody should abide by, and the trade agreements can provide that additional leverage and support uh, to ensure that level playing field. Now, the ILO has been given the mandate on, on various occasions um, to support that link, the trade and labor nexus. Um, and most recently in the Centenary Declaration um, was called on to promote policy coherence uh, for a human-centered approach to the future of work, which uh, recognizes and works alongside those crucial, sometimes complex, uh, links between social, trade, financial, economic, and environmental policy. So it's really, in the end, a very holistic approach. Um, and we have, uh, through that call, uh, been working uh, in a variety of uh, circumstances with both the European Union um, and uh, the United States within the framework of their uh, trade arrangements. Um, and I'll be happy to come back to that uh, after uh, the colleagues have also gotten a chance to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, often when, when I was traveling as a trade commissioner and speaking about trade, especially young people, they, they, they want to know how trade is made. And you refer to, to you know exporting in some some areas, especially maybe in the textile area or, or garment. They want to know how how is this made? Was, was there child labor involved? What's the ecological footprint? How what is the condition like in in, in the factories? So so having all these provisions makes a lot of sense. But do they really contribute to change? And are they good examples that we can can learn on of and maybe bad examples as well? Because that's usually where you learn the most, in my experience. Uh, but how, how does it actually provoke change in those countries? Uh, and ca can can more be done? Uh, you had some examples as well, Kathleen. You want to, to come back to that? And then Madeleine and, of course, Karen. Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm glad you raised this, Cecilia, because I think the question of how well have these tools been working over the years, is, that's been front of mind, again, particularly in the U.S. Uh, political environment. And, and as you suggested, there are many different ways we could measure success. Um, and, and let me just mention the three possible metrics. One is, uh, again, consistent with what you were saying, whether reforms have been achieved. And I think, by and large, the, the scorecard on that is good. We have seen a good deal of reform, at least I think the U.S. government would take that position uh, in our trading partner countries. A second metric uh, could be whether there has been the creation of a, a cooperative dialogue to address intractable issues. So things where we can't quite get reform, but there are issues that we can work on together and, and hopefully uh, bring those standards up over time or deal with them in other ways. Again, there, I think 
the record has been has been good. Cooperative dialogue is happening. Governments are engaged, working toward toward better outcomes. The third metric is that of compliance, um, and, and here I'm talking about compliance uh, generally by partner countries in abiding by the commitments that they're, they've made in those chapters that we've just finished talking about. Um, and this brings me to the sort of second important milestone in the story uh, for the US government, which is a, a case between the United States and Guatemala. And again, this will be familiar to, to many on the call, but it's one of the most important moments uh, where I think we could say compliance was not a success. Uh, this is the first and only full deployment of a state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanism in a US trade agreement regarding labor. Um, it was the U.S. requesting a panel to review uh, things on the ground in Guatemala. Uh, the, the allegation was that Guatemala had failed to effectively enforce its labor laws, uh, and it was a very long dispute, went on for many years. But at the conclusion of the proceedings, the United States was not successful in convincing the panel that Guatemala had violated the agreement. Now, although the panel agreed with the United States that Guatemala had failed to effectively enforce its labor laws, the panel also concluded over strong U.S. objections that the United States had not shown those failures were in a manner affecting trade. And that was the key language in the Central America Free Trade Agreement. You had to show the failure to effectively enforce the labor laws was in a manner affecting trade. So that meant Guatemala was not in breach. And, and that panel decision really prompted considerable pressure in the United States to, to make changes to this longstanding language, changes that we now see in, in the USMCA. So I'll, I'll stop there. Well, this Guatemala case, uh, Madeleine, we have used it several times uh, to illustrate how, how difficult it actually is to bring it to, to, to justice. Uh, but there are other, as you also alluded to, there are other means where you can, via dialogue and peer pressure and, and reports, uh, may, name and shame and, and so on, where you can uh, achieve uh, so, so, some changes. Um, Madeleine, um, the EU has rather yeah, recently I stepped up. Uh, its uh, its um, actions when it comes to to try to enforce the labor laws. Yeah, I mean, I I think what is very important from the outset is to step away from this illusion that there's a silver bullet, mm -hmm. and that this silver bullet consists of trade and that trade has a huge leverage. It is not, and I'm sorry for all those who believe that it is not. Um, a very simple example: if if you're dealing with union trade union issues of a teacher your trade agreement will not be effective to really reach that. The, the constituency is not part of it. They're not making the textiles, they're teaching. So, I mean, maybe in the end of the day, if you go train sanction route, you can um, sanction on Camembert, but you do not get a teacher's free um, um, respect of uh, his union rights through Camembert sanctions. It's a different constituency. So I really think, but, well, let me look. I try to put together some things that are not um, really easy to, to mark, um, but I would say we step up the leverage of FTAs where we could. So in the first place, I would like to quote working with the ILO. We've really managed to get this longer term vision embedded in there, um, uh, respecting also that the ILO is, of course, not at the order uh, orders of the EU enforcing it. No, it's helping a country to comply with international standards where, of course, there's leverage coming from our enforcement actions. And, and I would say that that interaction has really uh, worked, uh, worked well. Maybe Karen can say a, a few things about that. The, that enforcement action has gone accompanied by an enormous, um, by a big pro program of trade for decent work uh, capacity building. Um, so if you want the bit the assertive enforcement combined with engagement, um, what I also have observed, and I mean, I don't do them now anymore, but I've for many years um, managed all these committees in the third countries. And really what we do is increase the status of labor ministries vis-a-vis -vis the economic ministries. Um, uh, normally they were not sitting at the table in, 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 in trade discussions, but we had to tell the, the trade people in our counterparts, say, sorry, I need your labor people <laughs> because actually they're important. They're the ones that are going to help to implement these provisions. So we, we gave them status, if you want, <coughs> Peru and others. Of course, you don't manage a change within a day, but that's now part and parcel, and these ministries work now together. I would also say highlight DAGs, domestic advisory group, groups, and the involvement in FTAs. Not always easy to get there, but it is quite something to have a formal institution that advises you on the implementation of FTAs. 
Um, dispute settlement, I would take the example of Korea, I already mentioned. Um, so I, I think that the, these would be elements where I say, yes, um, progress. What I think that really, really works is to pull together the combination of the tools, huh? um, the trade tools, but also the autonomous measures, um, due diligence and responsible business conduct of increasing relevance. We are actually promoting a lot of these projects through um, and commitment through our FTAs. Um, and working through this, the fora. Huh? So if you have a labor issue with a given country, make sure that you're consistent in what you do in the FTA, in your cooperation with the US, who's probably going to pursue the same if we are talking about the same country, and very importantly, in the ILO, making use of the ILO supervisory system. Um, bad example, as I said, I think it's really taking action that do not target the problem or outside the sphere of trade. Um, I, I, I'm afraid that it will often be the, the case with sanctions. There needs to be a certain trade dimension. Um, uh, and I gave the example of teachers. Banned examples are also to, to take this in isolation and, and not pull together all these um, stakeholders, the ILO and, and the cooperation with the uh, various interlocutors. Thank you for this, Kevin. Uh, again, I know it is, is key to, to monitor and supervise and alert maybe sometimes when there are real important crises. How, how, how do you work uh, with all your people all around the world uh, to, to, to inspect and the dialogue with governments and, and, and the dialogue with, with the big trading partners as well to, to make sure that there is an awareness and maybe a sort of early early warning that now something is really going bad and it's going to the to the in, into the wrong direction and and are there more things that that us and eu and other trading partners could do to enforce and to push for, for change so thank thank you very much for the question Cecilia, and and also for um, madeline for sort of setting me up by talking about the importance of the allo supervisory machinery um which I, I think i'll start there because i mean i think it's um, it's really important to note that uh, uh, the ILO does, doesn't go around making up its rules and saying this is the way you should be doing things, but that you know we have uh, a robust uh, set of international labor standards that are uh, uh, adopted through business, labor, and government dialogue. So it's really something that everybody feels is what should be achieved uh, in terms of the minimum standard, and then is also supervised through both independent and tripartite bodies. So um, it really, I think, provides at the international level the most impartial and independent assessment that you can have as to whether there is violation or compliance of any given labor standard. And so it's very important to turn to that um, when you're looking at uh, whether there's been an issue with uh, a labor provision in a trade agreement. And so here I would just sort of pick up uh, just for a second um, what Kathleen uh, mentioned about the Guatemala case, because uh, of course she sees the Guatemala case from, from the U.S. perspective of the trade agreement, but the whole um, ongoing dispute had a real impact on the ILO supervisory machinery because we had uh, a complaint uh, at the highest level, that a request for a commission of inquiry, um, and that created a great deal of tension because should there be a commission of inquiry, that might lead into uh, the determination that indeed um, Guatemala was not in compliance. Um, and so in some ways it actually interfered with I think the the ILO supervisory machinery, and so that's something that we also need to be very cautious about when we look at how the two are linked. Making sure that on the one hand uh, they can really bolster each other in the in the good direction, but that there not be a interference in a way that might impact on that independent assessment. Um, but um, coming to to so so the so with that supervisory machinery, with the identification of the gaps in um, in compliance, um, the ILO then has a, quite a network, as you indicated, I mean, both through technical cooperation and through field offices, um, where we can assist governments. Now, one of the really important points first is the ratification. And so both, both um, 
Kathleen and Madeleine have talked about, you know, the importance of, of, of having ratification of the fundamental conventions. That enables that supervisory machinery to go into gear and to be able to identify where there are gaps. Um, and then that enables us on the ground to be able to be providing the support, the capacity building, the technical assistance, um, uh, also informing employers of their responsibilities uh, so that we can have a, a, a broader nexus really moving towards um, the application of these uh, fundamental rights. Now, with Madeleine has indicated, I mean, with the EU, we have a, a framework agreement uh, called Trade for Decent Work, um, which has enabled us since 2019 now to build our support uh, to 11 countries across three regions. Um, and it has uh, delivered on uh, the ratification of fundamental conventions, so Bangladesh on uh, the Minimum Age Convention or the Protocol on Forced Labor, Vietnam on collective bargaining, and a step towards freedom of association, um, as, as well as um, uh, the ratification of the Abolition of Forced Labor Convention. So all of that helps us to really have some traction on the ground to develop the, the legislative frameworks necessary to support those ratifications so that there is effective implementation. Um, now, with the, the U.S., I just, and I'm sure Kathleen will mention more about the, the very specifics of the UM, USMCA, but there with the um, uh, factory-specific rapid response mechanism, the ILO has the, uh, had the opportunity to actually be an observer at the factory level um, to support a free personal and direct participation of workers in secret ballots to express their choice of union representation. So really promoting an environment uh, for freedom of association on the ground um, and ensuring that civic space for workers to express their free, uh, their free opinion. I think one one terrible example that that led to something good eventually was the 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 horrific accident in Rana Plaza in Bangladesh ten years ago, where there was a fire in in a garment factory. I think more than one thousand women and girls died because there were no fire exits. There were very poor conditions, and this led to a quite unique cooperation at that time between ILO, between the US, EU, and several member countries, and lots of uh, companies involved in the textile fashion uh, industry as well, trying to, to work with the Bangladeshi authorities to set up inspections, to make sure that they can organize themselves in trade unions, and to make sure that they, the conditions uh, improved. And as far as I know, but I don't have the very latest, this actually led to concrete improvements. So this is also a way that you can work within trade, but also, as you referred to in the beginning, Kathleen, the broader context of relations that, that you have uh, with the country. It's, of course, terrible that such a tragedy has to be the catalyst setter for this to happen. But but I think in the end, it actually led to, to improvements on the ground in a sector that, that is in great need of, uh, of improvement. I don't know if any of you want to comment on that. Well, if, if you, I think it's a, it's a very, I tried to frame within the FTAs, but you're totally right. Um, I think that was, that was very unique. And what we also, what is interesting of, of this example is that you then see the development, how we started about with um, two, two aspects, actually, um, um, occupational health and safety, health and safety at the workplace, and, um, and uh, freedom of association and the core labor standards. And if you look at that, so that has evolved and to a large extent really was in a compact format. So collaboration of international partners and the ILO, that has been very important. And what was interesting for me is the development, in particular as this progressed, um, is, the, um, is the dimension of business and the role and the increasing role that came forward for responsible business conduct from our companies and from Bangladeshi companies. And there you actually see two sides of it. Huh? You, you had the Bangladeshis coming up and saying, yes, but there is something wrong with the division of the money, if you want, <laughs> and the pressure throughout the, the value chain. So I want to look at that end part of the value chain mm. where I get the pressure. Um, I only get money to pay $1 to my workers. Um, and, and a bit accusing uh, the ones up in the supply chain. 
the, the, the proof is in the pudding, but the important thing is, is that a dialogue has started to look at these things. And both the ILO and the OECD actually play a very uh, important role in that, what we now call purchasing power, uh, mm. because it is an essential element that business comes along with you to implement these ILO conventions. It's not only going to happen with, with, with government. So business really needs to play its role. Um, we still have a way to go, huh? but it's uh, the formula was indeed uh, very important and all the different leverage moments um, uh, come in at government level, but business also has an important role. Mm. Yes. You want and to maybe if I may... Yeah, yes, of course. May I just add to that? Because I think, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. And we've, we've worked quite closely on the sustainability compact. And, and there was, a, particularly in the area of occupational safety and health, quite a lot of, of uh, progress made in Bangladesh post uh, Rana Plaza. Um, and as, as Madeleine also says, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. It takes time. I mean, it's a perfect example of how um the, the the trade and labor nexus doesn't it, you don't snap your fingers and everything is is changed immediately um but also it also shows the the i think the very important um uh, cycle and connection between the allo supervisory machinery uh, because that continues to be looked at uh, in the ILO supervisory bodies and in the governing body where there's still the discussion of whether there should be a commission of inquiry so the government has to come every governing body to say what progress it's now making, what more progress it's making. So um, that plus then the, the leverage coming through the, the trade agreements, I think, um, does actually uh, move, maybe slowly, but move towards uh, an action plan to really um, improve the fundamental principles and rights. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Kathleen, uh, you wanted to comment on this, and but, but also uh, the very recent case, no comparison to the Rana Plaza tragedy, of course, but the very recent case that, that was between the US and, and Mexico in the USMCA, uh, where there's also been a much broader engagement than what you can find out from, from, from the written text. Sure. Yeah. No. I. I think, Cecilia. I think that the the um, Bangladesh Accord is one of and and the the other um, results that came out of that tragedy. A further reflection of the fact that governments are saying uh, more creative tools are needed. Uh, and so the the Bangladesh incident led to an arbitration. Eventually, the the accord provides for and there was an arbitration between unions and global brands administered by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Uh, my former employer. Uh, but generally, we're we're adding new tools. Right. New international actors are coming into the story. In the United States, the Guatemala case was really the impetus to say, hey, state to state is not enough. There are limitations on governments that are either related to their capacity or otherwise. There's limitations on gathering of evidence, as you alluded to earlier. And there's some recognition that governments are, are not the only actors at fault or may not be at fault at all in some of these stories. So that, I think, led us to uh, what's already been mentioned, uh, likewise, uh, by Karen about the, the USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement Rapid Response Mechanism. This is, in, in the US story, the, the biggest change in 30 years, uh, the result of this somewhat unusual political moment uh, in, in the United States, uh, and now considered very much, I think, the crown jewel of, of the trade labor conversation. It's interestingly modeled off of a forestry annex in an earlier trade agreement. Uh, but what, what is the tool? Well, the, the important point here is its direct applicability on business. So rather than sort of the state to state relationship, what we're talking here is, is the ability of one government to address a problem at one particular factory or workplace in the other country, in the territory of the other country. It permits one of the governments to take action against that individual company where the government believes there's been a denial of workers' collective bargaining rights. That's the key. That's the, the belief that the one government must have about the, the factory or workplace in the other country. And as soon as that first government determines there's been this denial of rights, it can delay processing of shipments of goods from that work site as they try to cross the border. So the, the border becomes the stopping point, the, the leverage point against uh, that company until uh, some more action is taken. Now, as far as we know, there have been uh, half a dozen uses of the rapid response 
response mechanism uh, for accepted petitions, as they're called, two rejected petitions, one case that came from a, from a tip. Uh, all of them involve Mexican work sites with denials uh, identified by the U.S. government. And all of them, in fact, related to automobiles and auto parts. Um, maybe just lastly, I'll say, how have these ended? Because I saw a question in the, in the Q&A about who we call these a success. Uh, USTR says these are a great success, but of course it depends who you ask. Uh, again, it's a very targeted tool. I think the companies who have been on the receiving end sort of see this as good and bad, uh, not, not just for business, but also for the workers themselves. There have been there's some discussions about what's the effect on community relations in these in these cities where this is taking place and some uneven effects as they've been deployed. So again, we could have a whole nother uh, uh, webinar about just that alone. But si since the worker is at the, the center of the Biden administration's uh, uh, sort of uh, motto in, in trade, it's not a surprise that it's it's seeking to use uh, this rapid response mechanism um, and, and that is important to it. Thank you. We might actually do follow up when we know a little bit the outcome of all this, because I think the, the, the world will be watching to see what, what comes out of it. I wanted to touch a little bit uh, upon the, the issue of, of forced labour, because this is, of course, taking the problem yet another uh, level. We have seen now the recently finished World Cup in football in Qatar. There was a lot of discussion on forced labour uh, there, among migrants. And uh, the, the US have just adopted the, the Uyghur Forced Labor Act uh, December last year, I think. The EU Commission has also proposed a ban uh, the marketing of goods made by forced labor and export and imports is still not a law. And then the US has since quite a while the, the Customs and Border Protection with a list of, uh, of indicators that ILO again ha has developed. Uh, can you, you explain a little bit how this would work and how, uh, how the, the the monitoring would, would function uh, to because of course this puts even more demands uh, on on not only on ILO but on on, on the the supervising mechanism. Maybe, why don't you start, Madeleine? Mm, thank you, uh, Cecilia. Yeah, no, this is uh, this has been a very interesting uh, interesting found in development and evolution. Um, uh, and we didn't start from scratch, I should say. Uh, you, you will know, apart from the fact that we have very regular exchange with the US, so we, we discuss about all the tools we have, uh, including on forced labor, um, but also because we've been developing several pieces of due diligence legislation. And the two horizontal ones are one new one, the sustainable um, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which is, has been adopted and is now in, in trilogue, and also one that used to be called the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. So that's about reporting. And this includes human rights and includes fundamental labor rights. So we, we've been looking already, and the, this legislation will set mandatory requirements for business to respect inter alia labor standards in their processes and procedures. Now, on the forced labor regulation, um, we've the, the key features are that this is an internal market measure. It's a marketing prohibition. It applies to products produced in the EU and imported. It also applies to export. For us, this was key for non-discrimination, to ensure non-discrimination, and, and we felt it was difficult to argue that forced labor does not take place in the EU. Um, I only need to refer to ILO reports. Um, it is a prohibition to market forced labor products. Um, but um, the problem we all know is that you cannot see whether a product was made with forced labor or not. So um, this is where the role of companies who need to know the supply chain comes in. Um, it is a ban, but with a strong due diligence component, also to make it compatible with the due diligence legislation. In terms of enforcement, we've opted for a risk-based enforcement to focus the work. <coughs> Uh, um, uh, and we will develop a number of tools. Uh, in fact, the Commission um, will develop tools in the form of guidelines for business, so due diligence guidelines for the governments, um, the enforcement uh, authorities, and um, it will develop a database that is to include um, a risk register, if you want, of countries and products. Now, in terms of procedure, 
Um, there are two steps. Um, so there is, if there's re reasonable suspicion of forced labor, this is the kickoff, and that this the inputs to this are, are the database, um, possibly um, submissions, etc. The enforcement authority will start a dialogue with the company. This is the pre-investigation stage. During this stage, the accent is likely going to be on due diligence. Um, um, and if this leads to a substantiated concern, which is a higher threshold, um, that forced labor um, has taken place, there will be an investigation. If uh, forced labor is established, the product needs to be withdrawn and there's a prohibition for everybody to market that product, um, whoever, also if they were not part of the investigation. There's a non-cooperation clause. So if a government or a company does not cooperate in the pre-investigation or in the investigation stage, the competent authorities can decide on the base of facts available. For those who are familiar with anti-dumping, facts available is whatever you have. So non-cooperation is in a way um, punished. Now, I think what is what one of the key interesting things that, that will come out of all of this um, is a bit what maybe if you want, I was listening to Kathleen and um, the information back to a factory. I mean, I think in the end of the day, this is where you would need to be getting to. This is probably what companies will want to know by knowing better their supply chain because they need to be able to identify which are the plants. If they want to uh, continue to trade with a country that um, is a risk country um, uh, where there is known risk of forced labor, you will need to really investigate in knowing who are these suppliers in these countries so that you are able to um, uh, to verify them, to audit, to, uh, to to work with them, to ensure that in the plant where you work, there's no forced labor. Um, I, I think this type of legislation will um, definitely push um, us governments, but also companies into getting a better grip on uh, working and continuing to engage with um, uh, risky countries, if you want, um, but ensuring that you can do it in the right way. Mm. Yeah, it would put a lot of pressure on, on the companies to be transparent the whole way through, which is easier for bigger than smaller, obviously. But, but um, um, we, we'll see how this goes once it enters into force. You have had this legislation, Catherine, for quite some time. Uh, what's your experiences? And how will the new GU Act in the Xinjiang province in, in China work? Right. Uh, wouldn't we all want to know uh, how, is, how is it working? Uh, how will it continue to work? Well, I, I think it's important to note uh, that, that these efforts are sort of in a way a category of their own, right? That these are uh, using trade tools to address uh, what we might otherwise call a human rights violation, right? Not, not the organized labor conversations we've been having in the rest of our conversation. Um, and here the, the pendulum really switches more to another agency in, in the US government, uh, apart from USTR, this is the Customs and Border Protection because that's the agency on the front lines of this longstanding tool you mentioned going back to 1930, which, which prohibits under US law, the import of any product that's um, produced, manufactured, there's a long list, wholly or in part uh, by forced labor. Um, and, and so if CBP, if Customs and Border Protection finds that's the case, uh, they uh, can issue, they do issue an order to withhold release of such goods. It's called a WRO, withhold release order. And they do that usually with respect to specific producers. Very recently, we saw that uh, happened with a Dominican Republic sugar producer. Uh, oh, yeah. But more recently, they've also used it sector wide in certain regions of the world. This was not used for many years. Right? I mentioned 1930, but there was a long period of time where there were very few WROs. In the last four years or so, huge increase in, in its use. And as you mentioned, at the center of the story is yet another, a new law, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which came into force this past summer. Separate law, an import ban uh, with, with what many uh, the lawyers who are working on this would, would point, point to this rebuttable presumption of forced labor for goods that are coming from Xinjiang in, in China, uh, as well as some that are uh, coming from companies that are on a separate list, so that now businesses have to provide clear and convincing evidence. This is a higher standard uh, that 
their goods are, are made not with forced labor. So uh, just to what Madeline was saying a moment ago, a lot of discussion related to the regulations that uh, will they provide enough guidance? Do they provide enough guidance, the ones that we have so far as to what's required of businesses? How do they do the necessary tracing all the way down, as I call it? Uh, how does the government likewise do its own research to be able to evaluate? So highly research intensive, wide supply chain effect, um, some possibility of like a trusted trader type opportunity now on the table to, to lessen the burden on businesses, but still make sure they've done their due diligence. Many other details, but th that's that's the gist of it. I, and we're starting to see now, I should add some some litigation, some very interesting mm -hmm. jurisdictional questions in the courts, but but not yet any any true test of the tool. No, and that will be very interesting to, to follow because I think many many agree that, that it, it, it's potentially a very good tool, but of course it has to work in practice as well. Karen, uh, b before we leave time for a few questions, there's lots of questions coming in. H how big is the problem of forced labour? Because uh, again, ILO is the referee uh, here and, and your, your lists, um, but, but how, can you give us a little bit the, the global picture? How, how big is this problem? Yes, thank you, Cecilia. And indeed, the, you know, it's always we're very happy to hear all the efforts being made to combat forced labor because, indeed, we just came up with the the latest estimates of forced labor uh, this fall, um, and we can see that over 27 million uh, workers worldwide are are working in in conditions of forced labor. That's nearly three million more than five years ago. So that's not really the right direction that we were hoping to 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 see. Um, 86 percent um, of that figure concerns forced labor imposed by private actors. Um, and if we look at the sectors that we're particularly concerned about, it's most prominent in service sectors, manufacturing, construction, uh, agriculture and domestic work. Um, there was earlier a mention of, of, of migrant workers. Indeed, um, migrant workers are three times high, more likely to be um, vulnerable to forced labor exploitation. So there's a, a particular concern, of course, for, for migrant workers. Um, if I might just say uh, a couple of things about some other tools that we have, in particular because also Madeline spoke to the um, uh, CS3D, the uh, Corporate S uh, Sustainability uh, Due Diligence Directive. Um, uh, we do, of course, in the ILO and also within the framework of the Trade for Decent Work Project and other projects, um, really uh, focus quite a bit on responsible business conduct, helping to raise awareness of companies of um, the, their obligations with respect to forced labor, both in prevention and um, in combating. Um, and, uh, and we are doing this really across the globe in, in all regions. Um, we've recently launched our forced labor observatory, which is a one-stop shop uh, with a wealth of information by country uh, concerning its challenges and progress combating forced labor. Um, it really provides not only information about the ILO supervisory bodies, but other international treaty bodies, statistical data where available. And that's an important thing as well, because hopefully uh, it will become a situation where those that are not providing statistical data will be seen as sort of the outliers and, and needing to get the, uh, their their house in order to be to be providing that statistical data, looking at what kind of forced labor might exist in their countries. Development cooperation that's available, um, legislative frameworks, uh, and 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 more information to really support identification of forced labor risks. For the business community, we also have a, a site. A global business network on forced labor. Um, and there, again, is a, a lot of information to assist the business community uh, in identifying um, areas where they need, it, like the, the risk register that uh, Madeleine was referring to. I mean, this is also mm -hmm. to assist the businesses in being able to um, attack that. I also wanted to mention that we are looking, we're carrying out research at the moment on trade arrangements as a tool to address forced labor. Um, which we expect to be published sometime next year uh, to look at the, the impact and the limitations, strategies and regulatory elements um, and, and synergies with policies, including the due diligence laws and case studies. So hopefully that would be very important to look at the, the trade and labor standards nexus and its impact. Yeah, well, there's definitely lots of, of, of scope to, to look at 
the, the effects of these laws to see how they are implemented and, and the effects and also the research that ILO is, is, uh, is conducting. There are lots of questions coming in. Some of them you have addressed, some are a little bit overlapping, but I, I thought I'll leave one for you each uh, and I'll read them up at the same time. Uh, the first one is for Madeleine and there are actually two questions. Um, who they ask how, how the European Commission will go about the fact that the new trade and sustainability development policy is not directly reflected in the EU-Chile agreement, in the Mercosur agreement, in the Mexican agreement, and then also in old agreements. How is this going to be reflected uh, now when, when the agreements do not contain those chapters? And then a question for Kathleen that uh, on, on the strong enforcement mechanism that USMCA has that is quite different from what anybody else has. Uh, do you think that there will be an imitation uh, in, in other trade agreements um, that, that will be done as well? And then there is a question, I think, for Karen that, that ILO conventions are, are very important. But is, is there a global need for a, a new, an extra, an additional tool? Uh, when when we check that that countries comply with the, with basic labor standards, or or is it more a question of enforcement of the existing standards that exist? Who, who wants to start? Kathleen, you want to start? Sure. Um, so the short answer is yes, and there are discussions underway in, in several places in multiple countries about uh, using a rapid response type uh, mechanism in trade agreements going forward. You hear discussions about that in the United States, whether in relation to the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, what could be done in that space. Uh, recently, USTR has talked about updating other agreements, and, and I'm often asked about the, the leverage uh, that one might have, that the government might have. Uh, to do this? And, and can the U.S. insist upon this in its agreements going forward? Um, to respond to that, I, I think one needs to think about whether this actually may be seen as a benefit to the to the receiving government, if I can call it that. Although this tool is reciprocal, uh, many will know there are very significant limitations on, on using it against businesses in the United States. So, but, but taking action against multinational companies, as this tool is intended to do, having the U.S. government on your side may not be the worst thing. But of course, it very much depends on the government. The, the tool might be structured in a way that's more amenable to both sides. Take Mexico, for example, right now, we have a progressive administration there that's receptive to this. Likewise, in the United States, we have a progressive government that wants to use this, but, but unclear whether that will be the case in other, in other places going forward. The most important point, I think, is, is what all these questions that you all have asked speak to. That is, the, the use of it in USMCA has, has opened the imagination to alternatives, and we'll, we'll certainly see some RRM-esque options uh, going forward. Hmm. Madeleine? Do you want to address the question of uh, yes agreements and also some of the so existing which do not have these provisions? Yeah, we, are, we have not arrived, not yet, but I don't think that we will ever arrive at the situation that we do an internal review of our FTA chapters and that um, we send it around and the country say, hey, that's great, I want to sign up. <laughs> so um, for all of this, this will be included in the review clauses um, that we will, of course, we have a couple of, of negotiations that have already been concluded. It's not that you just can un, 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 unravel one or the other so easily. So th this will be review clauses in the agreement. But I wanted to, to point at another development that I find quite interesting. I hear more and more actually that the mandatory EU due diligence legislation is having a, a diff a, a, another effect. We, we sold already... Um, because of all the project that we did inter alia with the ILO and the OECD on due diligence and responsible business conduct. So that, that is the international um, due diligence guidelines in the OECD and the ILO. We saw that reaction already coming mm -hmm. up, but by making our legislation, linking that to these international guidelines and making them mandatory, we see now an increasing call from companies, including from these countries, to say, yeah, but then I need a proper labor framework. Yeah then I need a proper labor framework. And that means that the government needs to ratify and implement these labor conventions. So there's an inter interesting uh, interaction because if you're a risk country, it is often a risk factor is you haven't ratified an, an ILO convention. So if you mm. want to get out of that, and inevitably our, our database is going to work with these type of indicators. Um, so I think that um, uh, from that perspective, we may actually... Uh, I hope that we create this demand. And Cecilia, I totally agree. We need to be 
careful that companies can do this, that there is, uh, that SMEs can do this. This is why we are paying actually a lot of attention already now at the design stage and the supporting tools that we need to develop. Hmm. Thank you very much for this. Uh, Karen, are, are there additional tools uh, needed or is it more an implementation? Maybe this is not something you could answer, but, but ideally in, in a perfect world where international organizations were strong and flourishing, we would have a multilateral framework for this and we would have WTO engaging much more than it, I mean, it has in the past, but, but also lack of engagement by member states. Do, do you see any, any, any opening there? I know that there are talks regularly between WTO and, mm. uh, and uh, ILO as well. Can, well, can we, WTO do more? <laughs> Well, obviously, yes. And, and, and you're right that some of that some of that is above my head. But um, <laughs> in, in, indeed, I mean, we 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 already had this discussion in the 1990s about the question of an enforceable social clause, mm -hmm. um, and then we ended up with the division of labor, um, labor coming to the ILO, um, and the 1998 Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights of Work, and sort of being excluded from the WTO. But I think that we've seen, and 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 even my philosophical discussion at the at the outset that we, you can can't really separate these two. Um, and, and we've seen it by the trade agreements that, that exist now that are becoming more and more common and the demand for it as well. Um, so I think that we will see what works in trade agreements and 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 how that uh, how we continue to use that leverage and continue to use the ILO to be able to promote those fundamental rights. Um, and then and we'll see, I think we start at this bilateral level um, and we see how that discussion and and this exchange by the way i think very important between the european union and the us about you know what works and what doesn't work and mm -hmm. what each can learn from the other and then how ultimately that discussion may be brought through the wto yeah let's hope that well obviously ilo is is key for this but but as you said trade and labor is becoming increasingly interlinked and the EU and US obviously in the forefront of this, but but also other countries are including it. I mean, the, the CPTPP has has also provisions on this. Of course, they were negotiated by the US, but but now they're also in force. I think there would be plenty of, of room to have a follow up on, on this discussion when we know a little bit more how it works in practice and the experiences and so on. I'm sorry to the audience that we couldn't take uh, more questions. Uh, thank you so much, Karen Curtis, Kathleen Coulson, Madeleine Tuininga, uh, for being here with us, helping us to, to uh, put some light on what's happening in, in this. Thank you to all of you who've been listening. Uh, wishing you a happy holiday and a happy new year and see you next year as well. Thank you so much uh, again, panelists, for participating. Thank you very much. Very interesting and hope to see Thank you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.